All right, I want to talk to you about a couple of very, very disturbing uh, stories. <sighs> Where do I even begin? Uh, let me tell you about. Let me tell you about what is happening up in Canada right now. How could I have lost this stupid story? Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell it to you. I can't seem to find it right now. I um, just had it. Um, Jordan Peterson, friend of the program, friend of mine, brilliant man. You know him. I know him. We respect him. You may not agree with him. I don't know how you don't agree with him, but you may not agree with him. In Canada, the Psychologist or Psychiatrists Association has just sentenced him to re-education. They said he will lose his license if he doesn't go in for re-education classes. And Jordan Peterson said, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. No. Uh -uh." So instead, he's taking them to court. When this goes to trial, this is going to be earth-shattering one way or the other. They don't have freedom of speech like we have in Canada. Now, he says this is infringing on his basic rights. They do have some basic Bill of Rights, which is ridiculous because it holds no water. But that's what he says. They say he's hurtful, hateful, and really, really doing bad things to people. I mean, he's not cutting testicles off of little children, but apparently his words are very, very bad. This is a huge milestone. This is a mile marker. If if he is forced to go into re-education to keep his job, We're in a different world, gang, in the West. We are in a completely different world. (sighs) Let me give you the next story. You know the statues that they were taking down? Statues in Virginia? The big, huge statue of uh, Robert E. Lee? Uh, They told us they were just going to take it down, then it would go to a, you know, cemetery or in a museum or whatever. They've decided to melt it down and make it into something that's more educational and uplifting. So they're going to take this great work of art and melt it down. I think that's a milestone. I think that's another mile marker. It's what the Germans did. The art they disagreed with, they took down and destroyed. By the way, I again don't know how if you're sane or rational, or no, no, no. If you're just paying attention, if you pay attention, there's a lot of people who are so very wrong right now because all they're doing is listening to the mainstream media, which is lying to you, telling you that, For instance, Hunter Biden did no wrong. Well, you can do that, but there's no excuse for your stupidity now. There are too many sources out there that you can go to and get the facts. You can can find them yourself online. But now we're silencing people. The left is the one that is banning speech, not the right. Anybody on the right who wants to take books out of a library, I'm not with you. Recategorize them. Make sure that inappropriate books are in a different part of the library. That's fine. When it comes to school libraries, I have no problem making sure that three or uh, uh, third graders can't get books that are sexually explicit. There's no problem. It's I'm not banning your book. I'm saying it's inappropriate for certain ages. Why does the left not understand that? Uh, You have the movie rating system. 
it's you know that uh, sexual movies are not good for kids. That's why you don't even go R. You have what? Well, it's not NR. What is it? What is the rated X version now? Is it N? Mm. NC seventeen. Mm. That's what it is. NC seventeen. No children. No children under 17. Well, you know, we've hit another milestone. In Washington now, kids are getting, uh, bringing home notes to their parents that say the school can keep their health records secret at the request of their children uh, as of the age of 13. So I can't take my kid. I, it's not like my kid can go off and go into an NC-17. I've seen people take kids into rated R movies. I cannot take my kid to an NC-17, but my kid can keep their health information away from me at 13. Well, you know what? If that's true, then my kid isn't on my insurance until they're 27. Because remember that argument? Got to be on the kids. Kids kids are kids. And they got to be on health insurance of mom and dad until 20. Wait a minute. That's not a kid. 27 is not a kid. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they don't fully form. Oh, they don't fully form the way they're thinking until 26. But I can cut the twigs and berries off of a 13-year-old. And they can make the decision. Makes no sense at all. So, I'm going to give you one more story here, and it is a remarkable story of being silenced. I want you to keep in mind, your kids, now if you're in Washington State, your kids can be in charge of their own health at 13 years old, and they do not have to tell mom or dad. Jordan Peterson is being told he has to go to a re-education camp. They are destroying those statues that they took down. They didn't just take them down. Now they're melting them down. Let me give you one more story. All of these are milestones. All right, so let me tell you a a story that I read today um, that I was shocked by. And maybe you're going to be shocked by it a bit, um, or at least my take. It is... uh, It's written by a guy who probably doesn't agree with me at all. David Valesco. He criticized Lenin in the Seattle Times. He no longer has a job. Now, why would you criticize Lenin? Why would that even come up? Well, I don't know. In Seattle, why would it? What was he talking about? He writes, I was just fired from my job at the Seattle Times after defending Hitler. The only problem is I never defended Hitler. In fact, my family was hunted by the Nazis. My grandfather was a Nazi killer who later almost died in a concentration camp. And some of my best journalistic work has been exposing neo-Nazi lies. But if you want to hear a story about intolerance in our country's most tolerant city and the erosion of civil discourse in American life, read on. I began my career as a university lecturer of English and logic. Then, drawn by the need to tell stories of structural oppression, oh boy, we're not, I switched to journalism. I have been a journalist for the past 15 years and have spent almost all of my adult life in Asia. Four years in Japan, six South Korea, three in China, one year traveling Southeast Asia, two in Nepal and India, where for a short period I was homeless in Mumbai. But that's another story. My work is largely focused on East Asian politics and culture. Everything from sexism in South Korea to the terrifying rise of Nazi chic in Mongolia. I wrote about North Korean refugees and Europe's racist opposition to the Syrian refugee crisis. While living in Israel, I wrote about uh, the Israeli soldier who was held by Hamas for five years until he was released in a prisoner exchange in 2011. Perhaps the reason I'm drawn to these hard stories in far-flung places is because my family background. After Vladimir Lenin Lenin, uh, turned Russia into one giant gulag, my family was scattered like leaves. My grandparents became refugees 
refugees. They settled in Patterson, finally, New Jersey. And the rest of his uh, life, my grandfather sent boxes of whole cloth, candles, paper, and other essentials to his beloved family, who he could never see again. My work on the Ukrainian refugees resulted in more than one story, including a piece for the New York Magazine about the therapist who helped a woman find the strength to flee her home amid the explosions, saving her life and the life of her mother and daughter. I was never prouder of the work that I had done. About a year later, I'm recently now moved from rural Georgia, from my wife's native Peru. I received a job offer from the Seattle Times to be an editorial board member and columnist. Our entire family had moved to Georgia together, including my parents, my brother, his wife. So it was a tough call. But after consideration, we sold our house. My wife and baby daughter flew to Seattle, and I drove the moving truck. I knew Seattle only by reputation, the great outdoors of the Pacific Northwest, a vibrant Asian community, a strong Latino community, too, so our daughter could grow up with Spanish-speaking friends and residents who routinely approved tax hikes to ensure those in need of help received it. Oh, there's so much to like and so much to sit down and talk to him about. I am a democratic socialist and my wife is a DEI trainer. Okay. Seattle fits for them. The job was rewarding from the first day. If I must say for reporting on the protection of orcas and the efforts to improve the level of civil discourse in Congress. When Pride Month came, my family proudly marched with the Seattle Times. What a beautiful new home, I thought to myself. How inclusive, how tolerant, (laughs) how naive. Earlier this month, for my first official column, my boss urged me to write about the local statue of Vladimir Lenin that stands in Seattle's Fremont, uh, Fremont neighborhood. The good people of Fremont enjoy dressing him up in tutus, Halloween costumes, and the like. I was more interested in writing about astronomical, the astronomical cost of child care in the city, but it wasn't hard to make a column all my own. I simply had to talk about my refugee grandparents making, uh, um, making Pelami, I don't know what that is, and Babushka, and my grandfather Joseph, the Nazi killer, who I am named after. I noted Lenin's secret police raids, his mass torture, forced resettlements, and genocidal killings. The column began by reflecting on Karl Marx's last words as a London-based correspondent for the New York Daily Tribune, in which he attacked the hypocrisy of Westerners who defend sacred values only when it suits them. Sounds familiar. In other words, it was about selective outrage rather than the statue itself. I concluded by saying I'm a democratic proceduralist. Didn't know what that was. It's somebody who supports a decision from the collective to, let's say, keep the statue. I like to call that a Bill of Rights constitutionalist. Readers thanked me. Some shared stories of their own families fleeing Russia or told me how their grandmothers broke down weeping when they reached America only to find a giant statue of Lenin staring down at them in the land of the free. Uh, The critics... Uh, the critics uh, said that no one actually takes the statue seriously. Isn't that weird? That's what the the uh, Church of uh, the Antichrist, or what is it, the Church of Satan, actually says. Oh, no, we're just, it's not serious. The day after my column was published, I received my first response. Seattle Times so desperate for a new staff that they hire folks from rural Georgia for their editorial board. We don't need more faux outrage, another reminded uh, us. Um, The the Soviets single-handedly defeated Nazi Germany, and that statue was just a funky piece of art. Still another. You miss the point. It's a joke. No, it's not. I also received a flood of positive responses. People shared family stories and photos. A retired high school history teacher said my piece was excellent, blah, 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 blah. So here's the thing. He's... He's being accused now of saying that he's, uh, you know, praising Hitler because he said, in fact, while Hitler has become the great symbol of evil in history books, he too was less evil than Lenin because Hitler only targeted people he personally believed were harmful to society, where Lenin targeted even those he himself didn't believe were harmful in any way. Well, I mean... 
I guess if we're measuring evil, maybe, I guess. I, but So anyway, he was saying this on Twitter, back and forth, getting into an argument. And the New York Times first, or I'm sorry, the uh, Seattle, uh, Seattle Times first called him and said, hey, you know, don't worry about it. You know, it's, uh, it's fine. Then later that afternoon, uh, the boss called and said, you're fired. And he said, what, I'm fired? You just said I was fine. He said, you have poor judgment, and you're continuing to engage online, and you shouldn't engage uh, these people online. Well, he said, they're calling me a Nazi. Um, I don't know. Nazis are kind of a bad thing. I think I need to defend my family. So now he's out of work. It was his first article. He's out of work. I feel bad for him. I feel bad for him because he's one of these guys who actually truly believes in these things that I don't believe in, but he actually does. And he's been duped by his own side. He's, he is the victim that you're going to see over and over and over again because there's no pleasing these people. You can never be DEI enough. You can never be ESG compliant enough. If you step out of line, and because this is a mob, if the mob decides that they want your head, they'll get your head. And all of the corporations will bow down because they're all afraid of the mob, or they're part of the mob. And I want people to understand clearly, I believe this exists on the right as well. You don't go along with the mob, well, then you're out of the club. That's not American. On either side, that is not American. American.